Welcome to This Marketing Show, hosted by award-winning B2B sales performance coach, Rick Lambert, who has been selected by many of the world's most recognized companies to help them market and sell to win. Let's join Rick now. Well, hello there and welcome to this week's episode of This Marketing Show. We're so excited to introduce you to Christopher Roche. Actually, he probably doesn't need much of an introduction. He is the CEO of Catalyst Consulting. Welcome, Christopher. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Hey, just Chris, just so you know, you're the first soccer player we've had on This Marketing Show. So uh, It's a privilege. Yeah, well, we were looking forward to this. We don't get a lot of soccer people, but uh, I know you grew up in Manchester and uh, hence the accent, now living in Milwaukee, uh, deep experience in the SaaS market. Now you're out doing your own thing. Congratulations on being an entrepreneur. And for you viewers, I, I've watched uh, Chris's clips on LinkedIn for a long time. I think he's really got some insightful thoughts on the difference between demand generation and lead generation. And Melissa and Chris, as we were talking prior to the podcast, a lot of our customers anyway are saying, hey, we want the leads, we want the leads. And I think sometimes, you know, people need to understand there's two kind of, you know, top of funnel demand gen and then lower levels. So, um, you know, Chris, as, as we get into it for our audience, you know, what, how would you say maybe businesses evaluate their lead gen uh, we'll get into different topics, but how would you suggest they kind of evaluate kind of their current position when it comes to lead generation from a marketing perspective? A lot of companies do lead gen just as a default marketing tactic. A lot of companies don't really understand the difference between lead gen and demand gen and therefore just fall into kind of what has historically worked over the last 10, 15 years. Um, demand gen is, you know, quote unquote, a, a newer marketing strategy and it doesn't make sense for every company to go after. So if I'm a company that is currently running lead gen, the best way to assess is this working is looking at really the metrics and the conversions of leads into you know qualified opportunities into demos into close one and start to really accurately figure out what it actually takes to close one of these leads that come in and if you have a fifty dollar you know lead acquisition cost and you have a you know 0.1 percent conversion from lead to close one we're talking you know fifty thousand dollar customer acquisition cost there is that something you can scale with because in my experience most companies that run lead gen for large high ticket acv if you're a SaaS company don't truly understand what that customer acquisition cost is and therefore have just kind of had the default of this is working so we'll just continue to run it without realizing that there are maybe better opportunities you know, you work a lot with SaaS companies, upstarts, clients that are trying to scale quickly. And I, I believe your specialty is in the paid uh, space. Is that correct? Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You know, and I think, you know, a lot of people may see, we'll call it paid advertising as more lead gen than demand gen. Um, do you see that as more demand gen or more lead gen paid advertising? You could run both. So when you run a paid advertisement for lead gen, it's a lot easier to manage and to really measure if it's successful. You know, what's the cost per lead? And from there, like I say, how many convert into that? From a marketing standpoint, it's an easier marketing task. If I'm a marketer and somebody wants me to do lead gen, it's easier to perform, it's easier to execute, and it's easier to really justify that ad spend and show what that return on investment and return on ad spend has been over a 12-month period because of the direct attribution that you have with lead gen. Whereas with demand gen, when executed at scale, demand gen can significantly lower that customer acquisition cost by not just focusing on who's really in market today, not focusing on that 3% that's looking to actively buy, but actually focus on the entire market with that demand gen campaign. And by focusing on metrics and having content that's ungated, that can be readily consumed natively on these platforms, you can actually educate and have your message reach a larger audience by leveraging demand gen you just don't simply have that contact information and the argument that i always make with clients or potential clients when i'm having this conversation is if the only goal is to get the contact information just go on to zoom info because it's all readily available it's 2022 it's not difficult to get a contact and an email anymore and that where that's where historically lead gen has been used it's to get this contact information coming through pass it on to a sales team, SDR, account executive, and really bring them into the sales funnel, in my opinion, far too early. And therefore, that's why you're seeing elongated sales cycles, larger customer acquisition costs. The reason it takes nine months to close that prospect is because they're not ready to buy right now. They're probably not even evaluating options, and yet you're trying to sell to them. And there's an enormous cost associated with that that most B2B companies simply just don't measure. No, good point. Good point. 
Yeah. So Chris, talk to me a little bit about switching from demand gen, um, you know, requires a mind shift um, and, you know, not just a campaign objective. It does. Yeah. Not it's like- a- a lot of companies, yeah, a lot of companies want to switch from lead gen to demand gen and they say, right, well, we're just going to do video view campaigns and they run it for a month and then suddenly, you know, they have no leads come in and hey, demand gen doesn't work. And the fact is, it is a mindset, a mindset shift. You have to view the marketing in a completely different light and really with a long-term lens. Lead gen can be very short-term. I can run a Facebook ad campaign right now and I can get you quote unquote leads that are going to come in. They're never going to close. And if I get into your CRM, I can prove this to you that you have less than a 0.1% conversion version from lead to close one. But a lot of companies, like I say, don't have that understanding of the fundamental conversions anyway. And therefore, when they want to make that change and they sh- and they want to shift to demand gen, they're still viewing the demand gen campaign basically by the same metrics as they would assess the lead gen campaign. And that's where the fundamental mistake is made. And that's when companies just don't give it enough time. When you think about demand gen, and just to kind of explain what demand generation is. I think for people that are listening that maybe aren't aware of just not, first of all, the difference, but just what demand gen is as a, as a whole. So there's two facets of demand gen. Demand capture is really going to be, it's a basically a fancy way of saying Google ads. This is your people who are in market, who are actively searching for a solution. So I'm typing in financial forecasting software on Google. We can hit them with an ad. We can capture them at the point where we know they're actively searching for a solution, get them into our sales pipeline. It's going to be a 30 day to 60 day sales cycle. That's a very easy win. The problem is there's only ever going to be about two to 3% of your market who's actively searching. And what you're going to find now as we're in this recession, that number is going to go down. People aren't buying it right now. People aren't buying buying software. People aren't looking to go out and spend money when we're in this recession. So that demand capture channel gets smaller and smaller. Whereas demand generation, what we're talking about here is how can we take that entire ideal customer profile, which of, you know, let's say it's 50,000 companies that might fit the bill of who is your really true ideal customer profile. How can we produce content that can be organically and naturally consumed by them over the course of three, six, nine, 12 months to the point that once they enter that buying mode, they're already brand aware, they're solution aware, they know the price points, they have some kind of affirmation and relationship with your CEO because they've been able to tell that brand story and they like the company. They like the story behind the company so that once they enter that buying mode, they can reach out directly. We can capture demand with you know branded keywords with just them coming straight to the website and it's going to be a much shorter sales cycle. So it's basically a question of how can we educate the entire market at once so that once they enter that 3% buyer mode audience they already know about us so they're no longer searching for financial forecasting software they're searching for a specific name and that's really the 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 power of demand gen compared to something like lead gen which is basically how can we get as many contacts as possible pass them to our sales team and then have our sales team go and prospect and continue and it's just a numbers game how many phone calls can we make if we make 100 phone calls a day and we do that every day for three months how many opportunities can we create from there what's that close one rate and be able to build it from there which is a much more labor intensive way of basically marketing and sales because you have to have an enormous sales team to keep up with these leads even though 99.9 percent of them aren't going to close in the next nine months well you know you raise it you raise an interesting question here, like what is a lead? And you know, this is a conversation yeah. we have with our clients all the time. I'm sure you've yeah. had a few as well. Um, you know, there's micro leads. There's, and you know, a lot of our customers they would say a lead is when someone actually you know puts their hand on your knee and says, okay, we'd like to talk to you, as opposed to, do you know? I know I'm catching you cold with this, but do you have a definition that you use for what is a lead with your customers? Not as a general lead, but as a sales qualified lead. So a sales qualified lead is someone that's going to convert at a 20% or higher conversion rate to close one. So when we're looking at how many people we can classify as sales qualified, on general, do we have a 20% or greater close rate from this stage of the sales cycle to close? Right. One? If it's not, then marketing qualified leads, you know, whatever else, subscribers and HubSpot and most, most yeah. of our companies in HubSpot, there's a ton of different names you can use them. But for yeah. me, I only really care about if they're going to convert up 20% or higher. If they're not, to me, there's no value in having their contact information because they can consume that content on LinkedIn. We can publish videos. We can have paid social. that's going to get in front of them on a regular basis. So yeah. why do I need your email to be able to email you a case study, which you're not going to read anyway? To me, there's just not enough value in that. And that's where demand gen versus lead gen becomes, again, kind of part of the debate. 
<laughs> you just killed our case study business there, big guy. <laughs> case, I'm just case, kidding. Case studies, case studies in general can be very, very effective when distributed, in my opinion, as a paid social tool when you reformat them where it's not just a huge PDF. Huge PDFs are great for the one champion buyer in the company that wants to go and you know share this internally at a board yeah. meeting. But for a lot of companies, especially smaller companies, when we're looking at how we can take those case studies, and this is uh, you know something that a lot of companies face when they start working with catalysts, they have all of these resources and we're sitting there and saying, it's not what you have right now is wrong but how can we put this in a way where it's going to be more engaging so we can take that case study and instead of it just being a 14 page PDF, how can we have that customer interview recorded on a Zoom call like this and then distribute that across LinkedIn, across your entire audience? That to me is where it's the same messaging. It's just formatted in a different way and it's more engaging. It's more, it's more readily available to be consumed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, you know, we, you know, we're, we're in the uh, throes of redoing our entire into communications website right now. And, and the teams actually, we decided to go totally case study and include videos for some of that top of funnel demand. You know, and if you're watching right now, you know, in layman terms, I, I think demand generation is kind of like planting seeds for the future. So when someone gets into the buying window, you're top of mind at point of need. And I think, you know, Chris has done a great job today explaining that. So, Chris, if you were listening and you said, hey, OK, I, I understand I got to do some kind of long range top of funnel demand generation, what would be some components that you would suggest as part of a demand gen strategy? Yeah, the first thing I would do is actually figure out what the customer acquisition cost and what the conversion average sales cycle is of what you do today. Only because if you want to switch to demand gen, if you're a CMO that wants to make this change or even a CEO that wants to kind of implement this trickle down effect with demand gen, at some point you're going to run into that question of is it working and should we just switch back to lead gen? Should we just kind of throw the, the baby out with the bathwater because it's not working? When you have those metrics, it's a lot easier to be able to say, actually, well, we've only been doing it half the sales cycle period, or we've only spent half the budget or whatever that is. It's a lot easier to justify when you can show, typically in my experience, how poorly the current campaign is performing, even though it's quote unquote profitable, there's a lot more opportunity to be able to scale into that. So the first thing that I'll do with any client is basically lay that out. So we have a baseline and a, a, a benchmark to be able to work from. Then when we're looking at how we can actionably impact and, and basically execute on a demand gen campaign, take the content that you have and basically focus on how we can turn this content that can be consumed without ever leaving the social platforms that you're currently running paid ads on. So if you're running paid ads on LinkedIn, if you're running paid ads on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, whatever that social platform is, how can we stop trying to take them to a landing page, to a white paper download, and then they can have that submission of the contact information. And when you think about this in terms of the percentages of actually following through and just to kind of rough, you know, rough numbers here. If we have a thousand people that, you know, get shown an ad and we have a click through rate, and let's say we have a 5% click through rate, which if you're running paid ads, you know, is phenomenally high and really high, not going to happen. High. Yeah, yeah. But let's say we have a 5% click through rate from that thousand people. Now we're talking about 50 people here in the landing page. Now let's say we have a 10% conversion rate on the landing page, which again is phenomenally high. Now out of a thousand, we've got five people who have actually downloaded the white paper. Now let's say 60% of those actually read it. So out of a thousand people, we've now got three people have actually read the white paper. Whereas if you take that white paper, you repurpose that into a video format that could be consumed. You can have a video completion rate of seven, eight, 10%, depending on the length of the video. You can have, you know, out of all of the, you know, out of a thousand, 500 people have watched it 30, 40% of the way through the video. So you start to very easily be able to educate your potential buyer at a much lower cost point. And when you're doing that over time, you're going to start to see those initial, those initial reactions and those initial indicators, which are hand raises for people engaging with the content. Is the right audience liking the content? Are you getting people coming into your sales team and saying, hey, we saw the video on LinkedIn and that's what made us reach out. You know, Do you have that self-reported attribution already set in place to be able to have that feedback loop? Because direct attribution just simply doesn't work with what this, you know, with the way that this campaign is set up. Can you start to get those early indicators to be able to justify shifting more and more of the budget into demand gen? And then over time, you'll start to really reap those rewards. Awards. Chris, you spoke earlier um, about why switching to uh, from lead gen to demand gen during recession is the best time to make a switch. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It's that whole education piece, right? And, and you know, being there at the point of need. So just chat a little bit more about that. 
Yeah, it's, it's actually a really interesting time right now to make that change. And marketing in general right now is all over the place. And, you know, a couple of points of context for you at the moment. So Google ad cost at the moment is the highest it's ever been historically. Mm-hmm. What happens when we enter a recession is everybody, every SaaS company that I work with and every SaaS company that, you know, I, I communicate with, they all want to make the same thing. We all want to switch straight to, we want to invest all of our budget into Google ads because we can capture demand because that way we can go and we continue to find people who are actively in market and be able to basically sell as much as possible. So the cost of Google ads goes through the roof. And what you find there's a customer acquisition cost on that channel is going to increase. And the number of people who are actively searching for a solution is going to decrease because like I said, with a recession, people aren't actively buying as often competition goes up. Basically the availability of people who are trying to search goes down. So the cost of that all goes through the roof. Then what happens interestingly is on channels like LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram, the cost of advertising in those channels right now is down 30%. LinkedIn right now is a huge opportunity. The cost has dropped 30% on the CPMs. So if you're looking at being able to test out demand generation, now is a great time in terms of the cost of actually being able to do that. If you can justify to your team, hey, let's not stop, let's not stop marketing right now because marketing is the first line item that companies want to cut when they have a upcoming recession. How can we protect all of our acorns and not go out there and not be aggressive? How can we basically weather the storm? Whereas if you can invest in demand generation now, invest in the techniques, knowing that demand gen is a long-term game where you're not going to get the rewards for nine to 12 months, what you can do is basically have discounted advertising on paid social channels like LinkedIn and Instagram, TikTok and Facebook right now. You can have a discount opportunity with that, be able to invest in the long term. And then in nine to 12 months, when hopefully we come out of a recession, and then suddenly all these companies say, hey, great, now we're going to fire up our marketing. You have 12 months of relationship building with your potential audience where they already know about you. They know about the product. They know about the solution. They know about the price points. They've seen interviews with CEOs. They have all of that context so that now that market who's ready to buy is going to increase only you're no longer a commodity because they're not actively just searching for a solution. They're going straight to your website. And that's where investing in the companies that invest in demand generation today in 12 months time are going to skyrocket. And what you're going to see is the companies that halt all the marketing right now, it's going to hurt them in 12 months time because everything is a lagging effect with marketing. It's never going to hurt them in the next three to six months. The pipeline is already built up enough now where you will weather the storm. It's what happens in 12 months time when suddenly you want to grow very, very aggressively. Yeah. That's awesome. You no, know, great points. And you know, I, I, uh, I think to, to those watching demand generation, uh, when you have someone that comes in from a demand generation model, they're there. And you may have mentioned this, Chris, I apologize if I'm overlapping, but we found with our clients that the customer is like more educated, more ready, like the whole sales cycles quicker. There's less competition because they've become familiar with you over the period where they weren't interested in buying, but now they are. So um, from a selling standpoint, Hey, listen, great points today and uh, no flags on the field, just so you know, you didn't pick anybody or elbow anybody. So that was good. Um, you're talking to Canadians here. They're more hockey uh, than soccer. <laughs> so sorry if we uh, mixed up our words here. But hey, buddy, congrats on what you're doing. Yes. Uh, I've seen you many times on uh, your videos. I love them. I think people should follow you on LinkedIn. Would that be the best spot to find you? Yeah, LinkedIn and TikTok is going to be the best places say to TikTok. find me. <laughs> TikTok, yeah, t- TikTok, I always say TikTok's my, my uh, library of content. It's it's all in one spot, and you can if you ever feel like you're bored enough to binge it, you know, knock yourself out. It, it's all there. Awesome. <laughs> Hey, congrats on what you're doing. We're cheering for you, buddy. And thanks very much for joining us today on The Marketing Show. Thanks yeah, so thanks for having us. me. Cheers. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Marketing Show. If you enjoyed today's show, please like, share, and subscribe to get the latest B2B insights to help you market and sell to win.